Hello, uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to this Digital Thinking. I'm Alexi Mostras, a partner at Tortoise. Uh, thank you for joining us on, I think, what is the hottest day of the year to talk uh, about royal finances. Uh, and it's a great time to be discussing this for uh, two reasons. Uh, the first is that um, in the next week or so, several sets of accounts will be published by various royal entities, which uh, will give us the first real picture of how the royal family has been impacted uh, by COVID-19. Uh, and secondly, and more immediately, next week, uh, Tortoise is launching an investigation uh, into royal finances, into royal money. And, and what we really want to do uh, before that is published is to hear uh, from you. Um, the idea of these thinkings is uh, that they function a bit like a newspaper leader conference uh, in the sense that uh, before a story uh, is published, uh, everyone gets together and talks about it, talks about the main lines, about uh, the direction, uh, and, and the aim is that by the end, uh, the finished product uh, will be better than it would be um, if we hadn't have had uh, this discussion. So please do engage. Uh, that is the most important thing. We've got some great guests uh, tonight, but we really want to hear from you, your experiences, fans of the monarchy, critics, it doesn't matter. Um, you can engage in two ways. One is to... Um, chat uh, by pressing the chat button and my colleague Liz Mosley is moderating the chat so she there she is hi Liz uh, she will um, uh, filter any messages through to me and also the other thing that you can do is you can press uh, the participants tab at the bottom of your screen and then you'll see that you have the option to raise your digital hand uh, which will tell us that you want to come into the conversation and we can come uh, to you. So before we turn to our guests, um, let me add that we're not really, we're not trying to portray the royal family in a negative way or a positive way. We're looking rather um, at the operation of an institution that's pretty central uh, to British life at a at a particularly interesting moment, at a moment of change. Um, Britain will soon become a uh, post-COVID. Uh, post-Brexit, post-austerity uh, country. Uh, and at the same time as these, these changes are happening, uh, the royal finances have increased significantly uh, from a number of different sources and, and their expenditure is also increasing. So this raises questions about whether um, that level of funding uh, should continue and, and how those questions should uh, be, be anchored within broader questions about uh, the economy uh, and about uh, austerity. But uh, let me make it clear, if you believe the Queen should earn as much uh, as, uh, as she wants, with no scrutiny at all, then we want to hear from you uh, too. So, um, look, before uh, we, we kick off um, with the participants, with, with, with everybody on, on this call, let me turn first to uh, David McClure, um, our, our first guest. David has written a couple of books uh, about royal finances. He's a real expert. And David, I wonder if you could kick off just by setting out very simply, you know, where the royals get their money from. It's a variety of different sources, but if you break it down, kind of where are the main sources of income for the royal family? Yes, of course. The main source of funding for the royal family comes from something called the Sovereign Grant. This was a new system of funding that came in in 2012. And what it does is every year it produces, it supplies about 50 million pounds to pay for, not for the queen, it's not a pay rise for the queen, it's not her salary. It goes to pay for the overheads of the monarchy, mainly half of all those overheads are actually staff costs and another 10% goes in travel. So about 50 million pounds as the core budget um, goes from the taxpayer to pay for the institution of the monarchy. Now, in addition to that, there are some private funds now, the Queen has something called the Duchy of Lancaster, which is her ancestral estate. And that last year, that brought in £21 million. And with that money, she, it's her private pocket money. It pays for her own personal expenses to run Balmoral, Sandrium, the private estates. But in addition to that, she uses some of that money to pay for the public duties of about half a dozen royals who don't get public money, but they perform they're working royals, they perform public duties. And those people are Princess Anne, Edward, Andrew until recently, and two or three other people. So the bulk of that money is private, but maybe something like five million pounds or a bit more goes to pay for the, for the uh, half a dozen royals' public duties. Now the other duchy, the Duchy of Cornwall, 
that is that is owned by Prince Charles. And again, by chance, it also brought in about 21 million pounds last year. That goes to pay for his private overheads like the Queen. But he also sets aside about five million pounds to pay for the public duties of his two sons and their spouses. So Kate and William maybe got about two million pounds last year. And last year, William, uh, Harry and Meghan, you know, up until their departure would have got another two million or so. So there are, I suppose, three main sources. The main mon money coming from the sovereign grant, but a little bit of money coming from the Duchy of uh, Lancaster via the Queen, and a little bit of money from the Duchy of Cornwall via Prince Charles. Uh, thank you. And, and if you look back, say, 10 years time, what, what is the pattern that you've seen in terms of these sources? Do, are you seeing incomes uh, and earnings going up? Well, that's a good question. Now, the, the new system that came in in 2012 was very generous, put it mildly. Even David Cameron in his, in his memoirs said, described it as generous. The reason why it's generous is there's not, there's not really a, uh, a ceiling to, to stop the money going up. So in the first year, they, were, they set it at about 30 million pounds and they tried to make it roughly the same and it would go up a bit with, with inflation. But in practice, it's sort of in the last eight years, it's gone up by about 50%. So last year, it was about 49 million pounds. In the first year, it was 31 million pounds. Now, the reason for that is that it is, it is based on a percentage of profits, the profits of, of an, a portfolio of land called the Crown Estates. Now, but what has happened in the last eight years is their, their profitability has gone sky high, really. So it was, in, they could have linked the amount of money they got to, I don't know, the retail price index or something that goes up at a, which is in, in keeping with inflation, but actually they linked it to something, a property agency. So, you know, in, in reality, this has proved extremely favorable for the royal family. T tell me, tell, before I turn to uh, Lord Adonis, who's, who's our other uh, guest, the Labour Life peer, uh, who sat in the Lords since uh, 05 and a former transport secretary. David, can you just tell me with the Crown Estate, what, what is the Crown Estate? How, what, what land does it own? You know, how does it operate? Does it operate like a private company? And, and what's its connection to the monarchy? Well, it, it describes itself as sort of as an independent agency, but it is pub the, the most important thing to realize, it is public property. It's a public estate and the treasury recognizes itself, even though it's called the Crown. Basically what it is, it's one of the biggest property portfolios in Britain. It mm. owns all of Regent Street, some of St. James's Ascot race, race course, and most importantly, it owns a large slice of the UK offshore, the seabed going up 12 miles. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason why that's important is that in the last decade or so, there's been an explosion in, in wind farms, and 15% of all the profits from Crown Estate now come from wind and energy. And in the future, the government wants 50% of all our energy to be generated from mm -hmm. offshore wind. So clearly, um, wind turbines are, are a big money spinner, as it were. They're sort of spinning, uh, you know, pound coins out, out of the system. So, you know, it is the Crown Estate has proved an extremely um, lucrative way of generating money. And yeah. um, Lord Adonis, tell, tell me what your impressions are of uh, the sovereign grant. Uh, I'm quite interested in why the Crown Estate came to be linked to royal funding in the first place. Who, whose idea was that? Uh, and, and wasn't it predictable at the time that it would lead to quite a substantial series of increases in terms of the money coming into the Queen's coffers? Well, it was George Osborne who, who, who did the deal with the uh, with David Cameron that led to the 2012 settlements. The reason why I think they went to the Crown Estate is because it, it is called the Crown Estate. So it sounded plausible when, as David just said, a deal was done to give um, uh, to, to give the monarchy a, a slice of, of, of a very lucrative um, property and, and land portfolio. Historically, th there's a history to this too, which George Osborne, who's a historian, would have been aware of which is that until the reign of George III, the Crown Estate, like all um, uh, Crown revenues, vested in the Crown itself. And it was when George III came to the throne in 1760 that, that uh, 
uh, the first step towards creating a, a modern distinction between the crown and the government was established. Mm -hmm. And in return for surrendering all of the hereditary, at least almost all, because as David said, there were a few, the Duchy of Cornwall, the Duchy of Lancaster, almost all of the hereditary uh, revenues of the crown were deemed to be state revenues and were handed over to an institution that became the treasury. In return for which, the monarchy was given something called the civil list, which was Parliament voting each year a sum of money uh, for the, um, the king or queen to fulfil their official functions, and that would be negotiated uh, year by year. And until 2012, uh, that was the way that the, the monarchy was predominantly funded. There were the hereditary re revenues and some private um, hereditary incomes, which the crown ha had but for most of its public functions it was for it was funded by uh, the civil list and the civil list in the 50s 60s 70s was often quite controversial for two reasons firstly because then there were quite a few republicans around and uh, some of them were the house of commons uh, there was a very well-known labor mp who was republican he used to go on and on about the royal finances and so on uh, but the second reason it's controversial of course is that uh, year by year as there were squeezes on public spending, it became very embarrassing if, if the monarchy was exempt from that. And so even though uh, prime ministers uh, were, anyone who's been watching the, uh, the TV series, The Crown will know that all of the prime ministers of the period were, were, were pretty pro-Crown. Nonetheless, they, they couldn't be seen to be giving a, a, an excessively good deal. So the reason the 2012 deal was couched in the way it was is that it looked entirely plausible. Indeed, many people thought including many parliamentarians, thought that the monarchy was simply getting its own back again. And it was sold by George Osborne as uh, a repackaging of the existing civil list, but without it needing to be um, negotiated uh, each year. And because he also had the consent of the then shadow chancellor, Ed Balls, who didn't question these arrangements at all, it went through parliament with no real scrutiny mm. and certainly no opposition. And nobody was aware that uh, it would... Uh, it would uh, uh, it lead to such big increases in the in the royal finances, which have become even bigger actually since the period that David was talking about. Because two years ago, another deal was done on the um, uh, on the uh, the crown estate, which gave an even larger slug of the crown estate to the monarchy for the next ten years, ostensibly to pay for the refurbishment of Buckingham Palace. But since there's no direct relationship between the increase, I think it's now 25% of the profits of the Crown Estate given to the monarchy. There's no direct relationship between that sum and the, um, and the refurbishment costs of Buckingham Palace. It's almost certainly going to lead to another very big um, uh, uh, accretion of income to the monarchy. Can I just pause you there for a second? I just want to- Can I come in on one point? Sorry, no, uh, uh, yes, of course, David, go ahead. Just one quick point, very interesting what, what Andrew just said. But it, to some extent, one person did recognize that this was very generous. It just happened to be Lord Turnbull. And there was a small debate in the Lords. And he had been um, head of the civil service. And he did point out that in the past, the revenues from the Crown Estates had gone at a twice the rate of inflation. So more than likely, it was going to be a generous deal. So most people didn't recognize it. But one person who had been involved in debates in the past and had been at the center of the civil service did see it coming. That's re that is that is really interesting. So there was an element of predictability. But um, Lord Adonis and perhaps also um, David McClure, let me let me put the the argument to you that um, Buckingham Palace and the other royal palaces had been chronically underfunded uh, in previous years, uh, and that th this money was just necessary to preserve not only the the the, the palaces themselves, but it, it was right and proper to support an institution that, that is actually quite close to, to, to the British state of mind in the first place. Do you want me to answer that? Or Andrew? Please, David, why don't you go ahead first? Oh, no, that, that is a fair point. No one is disputing that this extra uplift, this extra 10%, which came to 369 million pounds was needed. The palaces were crumbling, you know, they needed whole new electricals, plumbing, whatever. That isn't in dispute. What's in dispute is the way they did it. They just sprung it on everyone saying, we want another 600, 669, 369 million pounds of taxpayers' money to do this. There'd be no 
when the Public Accounts Committee had questioned some of the Queen's treasurers, he said, oh yes, it's gonna be quite expensive, it's gonna take up half of our budget. He never said it was gonna take up 360, you know, that big figure. Mm -hmm. And if they had done it in a different way, and they said, we're going to, we do need this, but in return, the taxpayer is going to get something. We're going to reconfigure Buckingham Palace because we're putting all this money into it. We're going to turn it into a, into a public museum. We're going to increase access. We're going to do all these things. Or indeed, hey, wouldn't it be better if the royals didn't have to live there and they lived in a place which was more comfortable, which most people think is sensible? They could have done that, but they just sprung it on everyone saying it's going up 10, uh, you know, by 10%. And, you know, you better accept it. Andrew, Adonis, do, do you think the problem is with the amount uh, of both the refurbishment, the 369 million uh, that was mentioned earlier, but also the 15% of crown profits, crown estate profits that make up the core sovereign grant? Is the problem here that there is too much money or that the amount of money was put through using an unaccountable process uh, without the without the proper set of controls. Uh, well, can I, can I make three points? The first is that um, uh, clearly this big increase wasn't necessary because the monarchy was functioning perfectly well before. It didn't need this big increase in funding. It's a it's a massive windfall gain. Uh, it's not at all clear to me that the refurbishment of Buckingham Palace that's taking place at the moment needs to happen on the basis that it's taking place at the moment. There's only been a fraction of the public scrutiny and public analysis of cost estimates that there has been, for example, in the refurbishment of Parliament. So it's, uh, there was no proper justification for it made. It wasn't, the justification at the time wasn't made that the monarchy needed more money, just that this was a more sensible way of funding its existing uh, outlay. The second point, which is important, is that um, uh, in insofar as that uh, work is needed on the royal palaces, and uh, probably, I mean, like all the buildings, further upkeep was needed. Mm. Though the it's not at all clear to me that further uh, in income was needed for the monarchy to do that. Not only has it got all those hereditary revenues that we've referred to, which are very substantial. But on top of that, uh, there are also the entry charges for, for uh, Windsor Castle and Buckingham Palace, and there could be further entry charges uh, to um, uh, if, if it was open for longer periods and so on. So it, it's, not, it's not clear that all of that's needed. Um, but the other key point, which, is ne which hasn't been properly debated at all and should be, is, is whether the monarchy needs all these palaces. Most people think that the monarchy, uh, when they think of the monarchy, they think of Buckingham Palace. But in London and the area immediately uh, around London, the, uh, the, the monarchy has five huge palaces. It has Windsor Castle, it has Buckingham Palace, it has Kensington Palace, it has St James's Palace, and it has Clarence House. Now, all five of these are huge palaces. Clarence House, which is described as a house, is in fact uh, uh, a, a huge edifice with uh, very large numbers of rooms, a huge garden and so on. When you go up on the London Eye, in the centre of London, the, the big wheel that goes around, and you look from the London Eye across to Buckingham Palace, about half of the green land that you can see is private royal gardens. The Garden of Kensington Palace, St James's Palace, Clarence mm. House, Buckingham Palace, and uh, it's look, it, a, a debate which should be had, in my view, is, is whether all of these palaces are required, particularly in the context of the massive refurbishment that's taking place in Buckingham Palace, and whether or not uh, it would have been possible to move some of these palaces to other public functions. That's really interesting. I, ju I just want to put a point made by uh, Alex in the chat, um, which uh, to, to, to David, I'd be really interested in to hear, David, what you think of Alex's point that um, the Sussexes uh, have given us a taste of what will happen, what would happen if the royal family tried to monetize themselves uh, as an alternative to public funding. And he wonders if the sovereign grant is worth paying uh, to avoid this. Uh, do you think there are pitfalls uh, of, of royalty trying to break out on their own? Oh, I don't think it will work. I, I don't think you can either, you can either be a working royal performing public duties or you can, you know, have a regular job and make commercial income. The two things don't, don't gel. It was tried by Prince Edward when he set up his TV company and by his wife, Sophie, who was into um, PR. In the end, there were conflicts of interest and they had to step down. And, you know, the idea that in some ways you can sort of generate money in other ways 
you know, you, you cannot sort of monetize in a commercial way the royal brand. You know, you do need public funding. And if people, you know, it's quite good if they want to, if they're unhappy and they want to live and they want to lead a normal life and earn their corn in their own way, that's fine. I have no opposition at all to, to um, Harry's, Harry and Meghan's exit. It's, it's just the way it's done. You really can't have it both ways. And um, can, can we actually go? Go oh, to Alex, who I asked uh, from the chat. I'm so sorry. Is a she, not not a he. Um, I'd be really interested, Alex, to hear your views of what what you think should happen in terms of royal funding. Uh, is the problem in your eyes with the amount or uh, with the way that the funding is set up, or or is there no problem at all? Hi, are you there? I, uh, you may be on mute. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Well, look. Let's 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 come back. Let's come back to uh, Alex. I think um, Andrew Andrew Adonis. One of the things I wanted to ask you about the sovereign grant was, um, you know, is this how much responsibility does Parliament have to take for this? Because, as as David pointed out, there were voices within government saying, "Hold on a second. The Crown Estate's income is is going up significantly already." You had Osborne come out. I think we, we've got a quote from him saying, you know, this is just a cons consolidation process. There's not going to be no substantial increase. And in fact, uh, Sir Alan Reid, who um, was the Queen's uh, money man at the time, uh, said that uh, the Queen wanted to follow the example um, of, of George Osborne after he cut public expenditure by 25% by also cutting her expenditure. And yet we've seen her, her costs go up in line with her income. But, but all of these issues were apparent when Parliament voted through this grant. So I just wonder what you think that says about Parliament uh, itself. Well, the way that the, Royal, the Sovereign Grant is constructed puts it uh, uh, largely beyond parliamentary scrutiny because it's a, a five to 10 year deal. Whereas the pre-2012 arrangement was a civil list that was voted on by Parliament every year. Uh, this is um, uh, only comes to Parliament every five to ten years, and then it only comes now after the Sovereign Grant Act was passed in 2012. It only comes in the form of what's called a statutory instrument, which is a very short debate and a single vote on the actual figure, what is the percentage of the profits from the Crown Estate that will go to the monarchy. So the way the thing has been constructed, it's largely beyond parliamentary scrutiny, and that was deliberate. However, I should say that how much scrutiny Parliament chooses to give to these matters is, is largely the responsibility of Parliament and Parliament has chosen to give almost none I think partly because the opposition the opposition is the way that uh, the Parliament exercises scrutiny functions generally in Parliament, in Parliament hasn't wanted to go there at all so when the sovereign grant deal was done in 2012 uh, uh, Ed Balls who was then the shadow chancellor supported it there was virtually no debate and there were no votes on on this at all and uh, when the change to give, um, I mean, this is, may, may surprise some of the people watching this, but when literally in the course of two or three days, it was announced that the uh, proportion of the sovereign grant going to um, for the profits going to the monarchy would go up, I think it was from 10% to 25%, which was a huge increase in order to pay for the refurbishment of Buckingham Palace. Uh, Jeremy Corbyn, who was then leader of the Labour Party, and John McDonnell, uh, they agreed it. And there was, again, a, a hardly any debate. And it's very difficult in Parliament to engage in scrutiny and debate if uh, the opposition itself doesn't want to. And uh, neither uh, Ed Miliband and Ed Balls nor John McDonnell and, um, uh, and Jeremy Corbyn wanted to do it at all. If Parliament had wanted to get engaged, they could have done something, for example, like set up a select committee. Uh, Parliament has dozens of select committees which oversee areas of government spending and activity, and it could have, have, have set up a select committee to, to look at the royal finances to see whether it thought that the estimates that were being made for the proportion of the um, Crown Estate's profits that were needed for the monarchy were correct. They could have looked, for example, at the cost estimates for the refurbishment of Buckingham Palace, but none of that has happened at all. There's been a, 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 a tacit agreement between the two front benches uh, not to have any debates on the world finances. I think partly because Labour doesn't want to be seen as, as unpatriotic, also partly because even though the sums of money involved are very large, 
nobody actually thinks that the Queen herself is on the make and, and people are sort of rely on her to see that the money is reasonably well spent and maybe in due course some of it's returned to the Treasury. I think if you had a profligate monarch who was seen to be engaging in excess, the public debate might be in a very different place. That's well, well let's, let's bring in now um, Tortoise's uh, co-founder, Katie Vanek-Smith, uh, who's, who's raised a couple of interesting issues in the chat. Uh, she wants to ask David about how much evidence there is about the net cost and revenue of the monarchy. But Katie, can I, can I let you make that, make that point yourself? Yes, yeah, sorry, I'm slightly sitting in the dark because it's so hot in my bedroom. So hang on, I'll just move so you can actually see me. Um, no, it's just that I don't, it, I think it's the point about transparency, which is I don't understand, you know, all of this is really brilliant and actually I'm learning quite a lot. But what, the question I had was understanding the net cost or the net benefit of the royals. And I think it picks up on Liz. Oh, she loves it when I talk about the Queen. It's picking up on Liz's point in here, which is, there is no transparency on these finances. I mean, Andrew just made the point about the restoration of Buckingham Palace. You know, I'd love to see what they're spending on it and, and do we get that breakdown? But, but ultimately, I never really understand whether they're a net benefit to the UK in terms of the revenues we see off the back in tourism or whether they are truly a cost to us because I, I, it's just so murky. The whole thing is murky. I can't, I can't ever add up the maths and I'm quite good at maths as you know. <laughs> And, and, and this is- Can I answer I, that? Yeah, of course you can, David. I was just gonna say that I might be presumptuous, but I think that I understand that Katie is a monarch supporter and might even have a couple of mugs with the monarch's face on it, is that right? As, as Liz has said, I bloody love the queen, but it is the queen who I love. And I think I'm probably in that world of, as you think about a modern monarch, I think this is the time to be having these types of conversations because for me, the Queen is quite different to when we talk about the institution of monarchy, you know, the, and, and actually what does a modern need to be and how do we want that to be in Britain today, I think is very different. And I have very different views on different on different royals, but the Queen, I mean, I do bloody love the Queen. But well, David, just before I let you answer that point, it, Katie's point reminds me of a YouGov poll that I was looking at the other day, which found that the Queen had uh, a 78 approval rating, percent approval rating, and and Prince Charles, her son, was all the way down on 48 percent. So, it does look like there there will be a shift uh, in public opinion when that transition takes place. But but David, just going back to Katie's point, what what do we actually know about you know whether the monarchy is actually good value for money? Uh, or not? What, what is the financial evidence uh, that is relevant to that question? Okay, it, it's a good point, and it's very important in order to make an assessment of efficiency to see everything in the round, to include all the figures, all the expenditure, and all the income. When it comes to all the expenditure, what you have to include is there's the formal sovereign grant, which is about £80 million when you include the Buckingham Palace refit. But that's, and people think, well, that's the cost of it, and it's sold as it's just £1.24 per each citizen, so it doesn't seem that much. But a lot, of the, a lot of costs are not included. The elephant in the room here is security, which mm -hmm. is probably, if no one knows, for, yeah. because it's uh, too sensitive for security reasons, but most people presume it, it is in advance of £100 million. There are lots of other hidden costs in terms of the Lord Lieutenants, which cost uh, maybe a million pounds, also the, the costs of the lost revenues from the duchies, which are 21 million pounds each. And according to uh, the anti-monarchist campaign group, Republic, they put the total figure at 300 million pounds, which I don't think is far off the mark. So it costs 300 million pounds of that to do it. Now, does it bring in more than 300 pounds? Well, the evidence suggests from one, one marketing agency that it, uh, tourist income is boosted by about 500 million pounds by having a monarchy. It's hard to say because even if you didn't have a monarchy, some people would still come to uh, Windsor Castle and the way they go to the Louvre, even though the French don't have a monarchy. But clearly, if you have a living monarchy, if you have weddings, for instance, Windsor, the, the wedding of, of Harry two years ago, there was a clear boost to the income of, of Windsor Castle. And last year, I think Windsor Castle got earned I think it was something in the order of 25 million pounds, 20 to 30 million pounds 
Buckingham Palace in admissions earned 15 million pounds. So more than likely to, to answer the question, it probably does bring in more money than it costs. But that isn't the point. You know, the monarchy does not exist as a, as a, as a profit center in the same way as the Houses of Parliament, which generates money, doesn't exist um, as a way of, of gaining money for the exchequer. They're part of the governments of Britain. It's, we have a system which is based on an hereditary monarchy and they have certain duties to do. And even if it did bring in money, the argument is that maybe it could bring in more money and the treasury is duty bound to make sure that they, they get value for money from taxpayers' um, pounds. So yes, it probably does bring in more money, but that's not the point. Yeah, I see that. Okay, uh, let, let's let's go uh, if we could um, to uh, Louise Simpson, who I think is making a, a, a point about the constitution, the nature of the constitutional monarchy. Do you, Louise, if you're there, do you mind making that point again? Um, well, I just think that we're all. I mean, they know they know we're in a constitutional monarchy. They know that in a way they're there because we let them be there. I don't understand why this should be kind of us scurrying around trying to find out information. I really do feel, has anybody asked them? Has any, is there, I've just sent another message. I don't know whether anyone's seen young Victoria where Prince Albert just sort of is completely shocked at some of these outdated, outdated whatever's going on. Is there some way that you can just speak to them and just say, look, let's all have a conference and sort this out without it being like separate separate entities they're not separate they're part of the the construct of the country that's that's it andrew, andrew Dennis, what do you what do you say to louise's point uh, in that you know we we all want to get to a place i think where we can look at the royal expenditure in as clear a way as possible and and we want to get to a point where transparency is as great as possible or at least as journalists we do, I guess. I mean, maybe members of the royal family wouldn't agree. But how do we, this is a slightly separate question from the amount of funding, but how do we, how should we get to a stage where we can actually see what the royals are spending and who are they spending it on? Uh, well, I think there ought to be a great deal more transparency and that ought to come from parliament itself, asserting itself and hmm. setting up a, a proper committee which oversees the royal finances. It may, may be something like the Intelligence and Security Committee. I, committee which uh, uh, which uh, doesn't which reports partly in public but also deliberates in private because of the security aspects but I don't think it's a good idea in in a, uh, a law governed state like ours mm -hmm. to have um, secret areas of activity and, and expenditure and just as the intelligence and security committee exists to oversee the intelligence services and, and looks also at their funding I think the same should probably happen in respect of the Royal family. I'm afraid this is going to have to be my last contribution because I've got to vote in the House of Lords in, in, in three minutes and it's not on the sovereign grounds, I'm afraid, it's on the fisheries bill, but uh, uh, I need to escape for that. But can I just make one final point on this? The reason I got involved in this actually isn't uh, because of any great concern at malpractice, though because everything is, is shielded from public view, one can't be sure that there aren't some problems in terms of abuses, but th there isn't prima facie evidence of abuse to me. What you can see without needing to have any of this, um, uh, of, the, of, of the private finances revealed though, is that the monarchy does operate on a very grand scale in two respects in particular, the scale of the estates and the palaces that it has, which look to me to be just not justified for the modern day. And remember, most of these are in prime central London where they could be public institutions. And that links directly to my second point, which is what got me actively engaged in this, which is that probably the best arts and co cultural collections in the country are in the Royal Collection, which is a phenomenal assemblage of, um, of, uh, of artistic treasures, virtually none of which are on public display. And the reason I got involved in this, because, you know, I'm a former minister and fairly cautious on these issues, is it seemed to me that uh, it would be a very good idea if one of these palaces, maybe St. James's Palace, which has no royal who, who lives or lives there or works there at all at the moment, if one of these palaces was actually made a museum for the royal collection so that the people, we the people who own this phenomenal um, collection of treasures, could actually see it. This is how I got it at. At the mm. moment, a good most of the assets of the 
of the monarchy, which are state assets, are to all intents and purposes excluded from the public. I mean, the public don't get a chance to see um, all of these uh, amazing uh, Titians and grandmasters and all of that. And it'd be a good idea if they did. And I think that's the debate which might be most. I'm not anti monarchy at all, I'm strongly pro queen, but uh, the, the monarchy embraces these phenomenal collections and has these huge array of palaces, and why don't we see the more that's actually made available to the people themselves? Thank you, so, thank you so much for that contribution. I suppose if there's an excuse to leave a thinking uh, 20 minutes before it ends, then <laughs> voting in the House of Lords uh, fulfills that. But thank you very, really, thank you for your contribution. I think that that, that gives us a lot of food uh, for thought. Um, uh, Hester McCreary, uh, can I come to you? Because you've had your blue hand up, and I, I wonder what you have to say. Hello. Hi. Hi. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Um, sorry, I, I put the blue hand up um, following um, the, the member who was speaking just before the last. I'm so sorry, I didn't catch the name, but who, who asked uh, the, the woman who asked, uh, has anybody asked them? I mentioned the, the film The Young Victoria, which I have seen. Um, mm. But I, I really want to second that because I what I think is uh, I would like to see a bit more transparency, not necessarily on personal spending of the monarchy because that's only going to upset everybody because you know wealth isn't equal and social media is a, a monster and these sort of things but has anyone asked them I, I i would really second that question because there's there's other things like if if anyone's watched the crown you know what i mean i, I don't want us to get sucked into a, a netflix built world but the all of the refurbishments at buckingham palace a bit more transparency on our uh, they're happy living at Buckingham Palace. Would they like to live elsewhere? Could we use those that part of Buckingham Palace for more tourism? Could we boost economy more that way? I would like to see a bit more transparency in the sort of understanding of, of, of what they're doing before we're just told, or we hear, oh, okay, they're spending X amount on that, that sort of upsets people and fires fuel to to some anti-monarchists. So I'm, I, I'm sort of hmm. I, I'm sort of on the fence. I'm I'm with with where I sit but I think it's it's dangerous on either side but I kind of just wanted to second the has anybody asked them because we don't see as you know it's just little British citizens we don't really see much transparency of that at all we only ever see any disagreements when when they've happened you know like Harry and Meghan saying oh, we would rather we'd rather not thanks we didn't see the the full story to that that's a, that's a re that's a really interesting point, and 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 I one I wonder Hester whether you think that the the economic situation that we are heading into, you know, the the recession that we're likely to uh, to to suffer through uh, the post COVID world uh, that we're going to have to go through, whether questions about transparency and about how the monarchy is spending their money become even more relevant. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Tra transparency on on how they're spending their money and transparency on their opinion as well because we, we live in a society where communication i think everybody agrees communication is absolutely key especially in you know the current sort of pandemic status communication has never been more key and yet we kind of have a, a monarchy over here that that only communicate they communicate on such formal occasions through such formal speeches with people and i know we, we don't want to and i'd um I'd, I'd probably vote against turning them into sort of reality TV stars. We, we don't want that level of personal interaction with them, but but a little bit more transparency on on the spending and on, on their actual opinion as to how are things going. It seems like um, Osborne and, and Dill back in 2012, I'm not aware, maybe I, I was possibly out the loop at the time, but that's something that, that happens between government and monarchy and, and parliament, sort of okay, and then it's done. And there's no, there's no general discussion of it. And seeming as they are our monarchy, maybe a, a bit more insight would be nice. Can I, can I jump in? Yeah, of course, David, go ahead. Uh, two points, on, on this sort of asking the royals. Now, I, I spend quite a lot of time writing a couple of books going through the archives. And one thing that is quite clear is they do have an input. They have their own treasurer who's lobbying all the time with, with the treasury. So if, where there's a major change in the amount of money, normally at the beginning of a reign or halfway through if they run out of money, there is, the Queen's case or the monarchy's case and what they're happy is about and what they're unhappy about or who should get money. They're lobbying all the time. They're putting lots of input in, right? And that certainly goes on behind the scenes, right? The other point, which is a very important point on transparency, how do we make it more transparent? How do you get know what's going on? Well, there are three things to probably to bear in mind. 
we happen to talk about something called the National Audit Office. And one of the pro, um, the other side of the, the coin for getting the general settlement was to allow the National Audit Office, which are the, the Parliament's financial watchdog. They're the auditors for us, right? For the first time under this new system, they are allowed to go in, go through the books, go through the sovereign ground books, which they'd always resisted before. So that is one way to do it. And that was a positive thing. Everyone agreed. Although in practice, although they do look at the at 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 all the figures every year, there's only been one report I can find since it started eight years. So maybe the, the audit office could be a bit, could have, you know, uh, sharper teeth. The other thing to bear in mind is that some areas don't have the National Audit Office. You know, we were talking at the beginning about these duchies, the duchies of Cornwall, the duchies of, of, of Lancaster. Well, they have resisted um, accepting the National Audit Office from going and looking at their books, right? They want to, the NAO wants to, but Charles and the Queen say, oh, no, it's a private estate. It's got nothing to do with you. In practice, it isn't totally private because for a variety of reasons, but we'll leave that aside. So you could get the National Audit Office going in and looking at these duchies. The third important point, when you're saying, well, you know, how do we look at them? Should it, should it be the MPs? The main uh, parliamentary watchdog, the main committee, the Public Accounts Committee, they scrutinize. They're supposed to scrutinize these things, right? And the problem is, over the last 15 years, there's only been, I think, four um, investigations by the Public Accounts Committee. And when I spoke for one of my books to a former chair of, of the committee, she, the one thing she regretted, the one thing she said was needed was regular investigations by this financial watchdog, the Public Accounts Committee, to look into the monarchy. Because what happens is all these faceless people, the, the, the treasurers, the courtiers who lobby, for the only time they have to face questions and you, for someone like me, who's a sort of, who travels in these, in this area, th this is a gold mine. For the first time, you actually find out what's going on because these, these courtiers who are very important in many ways, they run the monarchy. They have to face scrutiny and they have to answer, uh, face direct questions. So part of the answer to this general question is to get the public accounts committee to regularly scrutinize the, uh, the monarchy's money. Fantastic, thank you. I, I want to come to a couple of people uh, in, in the chat. Uh, Jelena, who's got her, her blue hand up, but perhaps Jack Jenner uh, first, who, who made a really interesting comparison between our royal family and the royal families of certain European countries. And he's, he's pointed out that, that some royal families operate on a much smaller scale. Jack, are you, are you there? Oh, I think we're waiting for his video. In the, in the meantime, can we go to uh, Jelena, please? Because she's had her blue hand up. Um, Jelena, what, what do you think about the whole debate? I think the, the discussion about transparency is really interesting here. And the fact that um, Mr. Mitchell pointed out that most of the money goes on staffing is really interesting and something that we've not really spoken about, or I don't think it's voiced that much in the media. And I think actually a lot of resentment towards the royal family and towards spending, and I think that's come up time again um, in this discussion, is the fact that a lot of the money, or there's a perception that a lot of the money seems to go to people or organisations sort of out with the Queen. There seems to be a strong allegiance to the Queen and to um, and some kind of connection in that sense, but out with that, the other royals, again, people have strong opinions both ways. So I think that transparency in that sense and thinking exactly to whom is this money going would be really, really helpful too. Okay, fantastic. I think that's, I think that's great. Jack can't uh, do video, but we can unmute him and, and hear his point on, on audio. Um, Jack, are you there? Um, yeah. Hi. Hello. I yes, wanted to I was just... Do you mind tell, telling me your point about uh, the European monarchies? Yeah, so my understanding is, is that lots of the European monarchies sort of operate on a much smaller scale. Um, so they have they, they don't have quite as so much money involved. But then also the sort of number of members of the family doing public duties is smaller and there's less travel abroad because they don't have the element of the Commonwealth. Um, so that's sort of something to think about in terms of the scale element of whether we want a slim down monarchy and what that model would look like. 
Okay, fantastic. Well, can we go to Kevil? Um, I hope I've pronounced your name right. It might be Kevil, um, who is making a similar point. I'd be interested in your views as well. Yeah, thank you. You got you got it absolutely right the first time. The um, first time. <laughs> um, yeah, I was. Um, I think at Christmas last year, the King of Sweden um, reduced the number of official members of his royal family, which essentially meant that the finances that they were entitled to was reduced. And so I think slimming down um, members of a royal family that don't do as much that aren't in the public view as often might be a way of modernizing and demonstrating that the, um, that the institution is more progressive, more, more, mm. <clears throat> more interested in in slimming itself down. I think that's really, I think that's interesting. David, can I put Kevil's point to, yeah. to you? Prince Charles has said, as I understand it, that he wants a slim down monarchy, but then you've got all these three sources of income, the Duchy of Lancaster, the Duchy of Cornwall and the Sovereign Grant, all increasing uh, with the possibility of a huge kind of offshore wind windfall from the Crown Estate coming up. So do you think that, what? how, how seriously should we take uh, Prince Charles's desire to to slim down the monarchy. Well, I suppose the question is when he said this. He's been saying this for 20, 25 years, right? Mm -hmm. This first came up in Jonathan Dimbleby's book, and then it got quite strong about I don't know, 15 years ago. He even talked about um, moving out in Buckingham Palace, making Windsor Castle his home, and there was also the trial balloon of getting rid of Balmoral, him living in Burke Hall nearby, and making Balmoral like a National Trust property. So that balloon was floated. My own feeling is that Charles does want to slim down monarchy and there was talk of only having about six people, but you know, he's waited a long time to be king. He's 71, he's probably not gonna be sovereign until his you know, mid seventies. I think you probably will get a slightly slim down monarchy in terms of numbers under him, if only by natural wastage, because people will die. And we've lost three in the last year through not natural wastage, but self immobilization or moving or whatever. So you will probably get to a lower number. And most on the point about Europe, of Sweden, most European houses only have six working royals. And probably that is a good number to aim at. We have at the moment probably about 14 or 15. So yes, the general idea get to something like the Swedish number, fine. But in terms of the other things, I, I, I have my own doubts whether when Charles is king, he will take the axe to the monarchy ha after having you know, waited 70 years for it. Is he really going to seriously downsize and make radical change? I think maybe if he'd got the monarchy 10 years ago, 15 years ago, when he was late 50s, early 60s, yes. Today, I have my doubts. But it's fair to say in his defense, is, isn't it, is it not, that he has, um, as prince, been quite progressive uh, on a number of areas. He, he's uh, made quite um, great strides in terms of sustainable funding and sustainable housing through his Poundbury development. Should, should we give him credit uh, for those sort of revisions? Oh, sure. And I think if he were king, would suddenly get a greener monarchy. Mm. So he would change some things and he's at the moment he's changing Sandringham. He's in charge of Sandringham. It's going organic. It's going to have probably the biggest organic sheep farm in Britain. So yes. And, and credit due to him. You know, some of his charitable work on the Prince's Trust is totally laudable, you know, absolutely what, uh, spot on. So yes, he's done lots of good things. It's just, you know, one of the biggest sources of money are the duchies. The duchies fund his lifestyle. He gets 21 million pounds a year. He has quite an affluent lifestyle. Is he really, when king, going to say, yes, I'm going to surrender that money to the state, as many people, uh, many people have suggested? I think not. Do you, do you mind if we just talk about the, the duchies for, for a bit? Um, because the Duchy of Cornwall, in, in particular, is so, is, is so interesting. It, it li a bit like the Crown Estate, a bit like the Duchy of Lancaster, it operates as a, as a landlord, uh, and it owns a, a, a lot of, of property. Um, and it produces a surplus every year that, that goes to Charles, although he's not entitled to its capital assets. But critics have said that the duchy tries to have its cake and eat it in the sense that in some ways it says it's a private 
institution, but in other ways it benefits from being seen by the government as a crown institution. And David, I wonder if you could just explain why that criticism has been leveled. Yeah, well, well, the status of the Duchy of Cornwall has been challenged for the last 200 years. You know, when it was set up in the 14th century, yes, it was totally private, right? But over time, it's got totally linked to the crown, whilst today, effectively, it is semi-public. I would argue it's three quarters public. It's more public than private because there are various things that happen by law. Uh, the, the counts of the duchy have to be given to parliament every year. And for instance, when Charles was a minor, 90% of all the income from the duchy, his private duchy, 90% of all that income went into the public grant, into what was the civil list, which is today the, the, the um, sovereign grant. So the money wasn't totally private then. And even today, you know, five million pounds of his money goes to pay for the public duties of, of William and Harry. So it is not private, right? So that, that's one point to be said. It is almost public, but not totally, you know? And that, that argument has to be made. The other thing to say in terms of wanting their cake and eat it is that um, the, the, the real problem with the duchy is there's a lack of, of connection between how much money Charles gets from it and how much he actually needs, right? For instance, in the last 20 years, the revenues from his duchy have gone up by, have trebled, right? And I don't think in the last 20 years, his normal overheads have trebled. So if you were, if you were a business manager, if you're an accountant, you would first say, well, how much do you need? Then how much do you need from the duchy? And then maybe the surplus from the duchy could go into the public pot or whatever. But what happens is there's no direct connection between the two. The money just goes up and up and Charles spends it. So I, I think, you know, under a form system, you might want to look at whether he's getting more than he needs. Yeah, before we, we kind of go into the last um, eight or eight or nine minutes, is anyone, it'd be quite interesting to hear anyone on the chat who has, you know, an extreme view on this. We, we've been pretty sensible during this discussion. Uh, we, we've sat on the fence, we've been nuanced. But if anyone has, you know, a view that this whole thing is, is a, you know, needs to be abolished uh, on the one hand, or on the other hand, if somehow we shouldn't be asking these sort of questions because it's it's obvious that the monarchy uh, is of such a benefit then could, could you please put your hand up and I'll come to you um, I'm not sure if this applies but Edwin Magritte Mag Magritte <laughs> Magritte Magritte sorry sorry <laughs> what do you want what do you want to say what's your view the thing is that the whole thing seems to me to have been should have been left in antiquity. The only reason it exists is that there's a whole host of people who get things like from it, you know, get the lordships, sirs, be a, you know, British medals. I say, oh, this thing is that somebody wants, and it's the only reason it still exists because everybody wants to be in it or thinks they can maybe get there. I have absolutely no reason I can see why it exists. It should be done away with. Okay, they maybe want to treat this figurehead, but the rest of it is just a whole host of people who can, whenever they feel like it, can order a helicopter to take them to go play golf. They can shoot about the world at the drop of a hat. Well, they've got a government that had to be talked into feeding children who have got on free meals during the holidays. Hmm. The whole thing is this one end of the thing to the other just does not make sense to me. Okay, well, I, that's a very powerful point, especially about the, uh, the food. Um, Sumit Sharma, I, I think that you might feel a similar uh, way towards the monarchy. Are you there? Yes, I'm here. Uh, yes, I, I feel very passionately that in a modern nation like ours, there is no need for any institution like this to exist at all, irrespective of the fact what amount of fund it brings us, because uh, it is a nation of equals. Every citizen should be entitled to hold a presidential position or a ceremonial position like this. And we can learn the lesson if we are less arrogant. 
from countries like Japan, where monarchy sort of still exists, but it's completely under the control of the government. There is more they give to the people rather than they take from the people. If duchy of, um, you know, if the duchy is only meant to serve um, Charles, then uh, and and he keeps on taking from the public as well, and he gives back nothing in return except for a few handshakes and you know a few photo ops. Then I'm sorry, it's a completely outdated institution. There is so much unnecessary nostalgia, just like for everything else here, which which actually serves the purpose, except for this monarchy. Um, I think with the Queen, uh, this institution itself should go. It's easier said than done, but that's my wish. And Sumit, do you, do you think that there's a way of saving it by uh, slimming it down to a, to a Swedish model? So uh, the thing is, do we find it relevant as a country? Do I, can I accept that one line of blood in 2021 will continue to rule, uh, you know, will continue to be our head how is it even ethically, uh, you know, how can I accept it? I don't really care about whether it generates money or not. I care about this has to be properly a country of equals. You know, there's so many examples in the world. Why can't we be? Why are we clinging on to it? Uh, you know, it's, it's past its sell by date. Uh, we have to move on to a modern nation. So slimming it down, it will be a compromise. But to what end? It, you know, it's, it's just, it, it has to end. That's 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 interesting. I'm going to come to Nacho uh, Mores. I'm probably I'm almost certainly uh, messed up your last name, Nacho. Are you there? No, no, no. It's almost perfect. Uh, I think you're being, uh, being kind. What what uh, what are your views on this? Okay, so the thing is that I I think we have to see that the the British monarchy is a very idiosyncratic institution that could not be really compared with other monarchies in Europe. Yeah. Like for instance, if you say in Spain, Prince owns a company products are the organic products that are sold in weight rows, you, you would get a, a mob with torches going in, in, <laughs> to put the palace in flames. I think that that would not be accepted at all. And so I think that we are, we are talking about different institutions. Spain as well has gone through a, a very sharp reduction, basically because of some uh, corruption investigations. Uh, basically the, the, the king has fired his own father on the, uh, from the, from the uh, he has uh, removed him from, from, his, uh, from his annual allowance, et cetera. So uh, it's just now king, queen, and their two daughters. But there is another point that I think is idiosyncratic to the to the British model that is uh, the Queen. The Queen is is not a character that you can reproduce. The thing is that probably no one in history can have the gravitas and and the weight that the, the Queen has in the UK right now. I think that she has lived through everything. World War Two. Uh, 11 prime ministers or whoever the, whichever the name, she has always uh, kept her, her, her aplomb, her sobriety. I think that obviously it's, it's an, she comes from an age where things were more, were more private. Okay, now no. everybody knows everything about everyone. So the thing is that it, it's not, the thing is that Charles, when he becomes king, he will not inherit the unquestionability that Queen Elizabeth has. Okay, thank you so much for that. Uh, we, we've got one minute to go. So uh, I think it just falls uh, to me to, to sum up a couple of the, of the points that were made. I, th this is a really interesting debate because you can have it in two directions. You can either have it on an ideological level, which is, is the monarchy something that, that Britain should um, either celebrate or tolerate in, in today's age. And, you know, individuals like uh, Edwin and, and Summit made, made very powerful arguments uh, that, that we should not, that the whole process of a hereditary monarchy is, is simply unfair. Um, that's certainly a, a legitimate debate to have on one level. The other debate is, yes, okay, there's a monarchy in Britain. Is there reform to um, take place, which should take place in, in how it operates in its scale 
uh, and in its transparency. Uh, and I, I think one of the most powerful points that was made by, by people like Hester um, and Louise uh, was, was around transparency and around, have we actually asked the royal household how it spends uh, its money? Uh, has, has that conversation taken place? Uh, and it struck me because journalists have asked that, that question, but the majority of decisions around royal finances don't involve the public. Uh, the, the sovereign grant is uh, debated and decided by three people. Uh, the royal, they're called the royal trustees. They're the prime minister, the chancellor, and the keeper of the privy purse. And um, I think that speaks quite powerfully to some of the points that were being made about uh, transparency. Um, I think the, the, the second point that was really interesting uh, was about government scrutiny that, the, that David raised. The NAO seems to have not done a particularly good job uh, in analyzing royal finances. The Public Accounts Committee uh, has questions to answer. Do we need, as Lord Adonis suggested, a, a specific committee uh, to look at royal finances? And actually, is there a problem in parliamentary accountability where no one from any party wants to criticize uh, the monarchy? Um, is that a, an accountability problem uh, for democracy? Now, of course, the, the other point that was very powerfully made by people like Nacho and Alex uh, was that, you know, the Queen is in a, a special position. Uh, the love and respect uh, for the Queen stands apart from other members of her family. And what's going to happen after uh, she dies and Charles comes on the throne to that uh, is, is unclear. Um, there were interesting points from... Uh, Kevil and uh, from uh, David about um, European royalty. Could we move towards a slimmed down uh, monarchy along the lines of uh, Sweden and other countries like that? Uh, and there were specific issues within this whole kind of debate uh, that looked like they need specific journalistic attention, like the Duchy of Cornwall, this very odd enterprise that gives Charles 20 million pounds a year with not much scrutiny and a lot of advantages that other enterprises uh, don't have. So there's a lot for us to go at. If you have any ideas or thoughts about what our coverage should be next week, about the points we should make, about how we should prioritize things, then please email me, alexi at tortoisemedia.com. Uh, and it just remains for me to thank everyone tonight, uh, especially uh, David uh, and Andrew. Uh, we can't um, say goodbye to each other so we can wave each other off. Have a really lovely evening. Thank you very That's much. Fun. Bye now.